In 1 Peter, the third chapter, it tells us that it tells us to uh, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. I told you last time about my friend that asked me, Stan, when is the end going to come? What, what, when is the day? What, I mean, what, what time setting is there going to be? You know, what, how long do we have was his question. And what hope do we have? When we read this scripture in Peter that Peter wrote so many centuries ago, what is the hope that we have within us? How can we finally put to rest, too, the unanswered question about our future and about the future of our children and our, maybe someday, if I'm lucky, grandchildren? Um, and so we come now to the next part of the study of the book of Revelation. I've skipped over this for several weeks and months now, and I promised that I would get back to it. And I want to turn, if you will, uh, to Revelation. <clears throat> Let's see. I believe that we ended uh, in chapter 5, so we begin in chapter Revelation chapter 6 uh, today. I want to give a little bit of an overview, or maybe a review. This is the book of Revelation. This was John who wrote the book of Revelation. About 95 A.D., he was a very elderly man by now. He was in exile, we learned in the first book of Revelation, on the Isle of Patmos, and in the Scripture it tells us that he was in the Isle of Patmos for the Word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, the Isle of Patmos, as I told you, was a completely abandoned, uh, treeless island that they put prisoners, or political prisoners, to just live out their life and simply die. The legend has it that he did actually eventually get off of that island, but we don't know that for sure. But John was there in the Isle of Patmos for doing what we do, preaching the Word of God and having the testimony of Jesus Christ. We'll talk about that in a, minute, in a moment and what that means. He was put there as a prisoner, a political prisoner, for preaching the Word of God. He was in exile, and he wrote this book. Now, this book, this book is not the revelation of John, as it says in my Bible here, but we know that it is the Revelation, as the first verse tells us, the revelation of Jesus Christ. He is the revelator. This book, the revelation, or the apocalypse, as they call it, and there's all kinds of movies and books out there, and people have a misunderstanding about the word apocalypse. They think it means disaster, but it actually means to reveal, revealing. I see some of you mouthing the words there before me. The apocalypsis means to reveal, and we know that Jesus is the revelator. So he told John, gave John instructions to write what he saw. John saw this frightening vision of this being that appeared to him and told him to write down. And, told, and he said, I am Alpha and Omega, absolutely identifying who he was. He received these instructions to write down what he saw. He gave him uh, instructions to several of the churches that were in Asia Minor. He told him to write letters to each one of those seven churches so that all seven churches could, be, could read what was written to each one of those churches. And in those letters to the churches, he gave accolades along with warning and rebuke to each one of them. And then suddenly, John sees as if it were a door open in heaven. He's transported in his mind into what was called the day of the Lord. And I talked about what that meant, that he wasn't there on a Sunday, the day of the Lord, but that he was transported into time, into the day of the Lord and what that means. The coming of Jesus Christ, that day, the, the day, the only day in Scripture that is referred to as that day. That's unmistakable when you read that. It's called that day or the day of the Lord, the, the Lord's day. He saw this door open and he was invited in to see the very throne of God along with all of these heavenly hosts and these four creatures, these unbelievable looking creatures that he saw. Um, let's see, those are over in uh, chapter 4, verse 7. There was a lion, a calf, and a man, and an eagle. Each one of them looked different but they had certain characteristics and each one of these big each one of these creatures were about to say something to John and you're going to we're going to read that in just a moment and then he saw 
in, in chapter 3, this scroll. And he was very upset and he wept because there was no one worthy to read or to unroll this scroll. And it says, every, everyone in heaven there, that all of these creatures were wondering who was worthy to open this book. And of course, we read down in verse 5 of chapter 5, uh, chapter 5 uh, it says, Weep not, behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, had prevailed to open the book. And we know that's Jesus Christ. Jesus said, you know, the, the scripture, the prophecy that the, that the scepter would not depart from Judah, that Jesus Christ, in fact, was a Jew, and that he was of the tribe of David, of the root of David, that he came through David's lineage. It says that he has prevailed to open the book, and he's called the Lamb. John called him the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. It's unmistakable who this is referring to. And now I want to concentrate now on uh, chapter 5 and verse uh, 12. It says, saying with the Lord's, with a loud voice, he heard this loud voice of all of this innumerable multitude, worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive, pause, time out. What was it that Mark was talking about here? that is prevalent in our world today, the, the search and the grasping of power and riches and wisdom and money and strength and honor and glory, but who does it say is worthy to receive these? It says, worthy is the land that is slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessings. And how did he get it? How did he get all of those? Blessings. Did he go out there and grab it and just take it and run over people and step on people to get it? No, he did it exactly the opposite. He taught us how we can receive power and blessings and strength and wisdom and glory by following his example, wasn't it? By being humble and being a servant. So in chapter 6 and verse 1, we'll begin there. This great exalted being began to, as we read in verse 5, open these seals. In verse, uh, I mean in chapter 6, verse 1, it says, And I saw the Lamb open one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts, saying, Come and see. Now, Jameson Fawcett Brown adds this comment in there that some of the ancient manuscripts do not say, Come and see. They just say, Come. And they say that this is repeated four times as a call to the world to come. Come to me. But I don't know if that's necessarily true. I think it's an interesting point, maybe as a side. Because down in verse 2 it says that John said, I saw. So he did go or wherever he went. And he was able to see what they were trying to reveal to him. And he says, behold, a white horse. Now... This white horse, and it says, he that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given unto him. A lot of, a lot of the commentaries, even some of uh, the commentaries that Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown quote say that this is a reference to Jesus Christ here. A couple of things in mind here. Jesus, on one hand, though, is never depicted as having a bow. What's the weapon of choice that Jesus is always described as having? A sword, isn't it? A sharp two-edged sword that cuts to the marrow of the bone. That's what the weapon that Jesus is described as always having. And also the word crown here is Stephanos in the Greek, which means a wreath, like a little wreath that the champion of a race would wear. In other places, when it's describing Jesus Christ, it says that he has a diademata, a diadem, that he has a crown of... He has many crowns, multiple crowns, not just one. So there's a little bit of difference in here in the description of this, this being here or this personage here and that's, that's been mistaken as maybe being interpreted as being Jesus Christ uh, when in fact that it is actually the opposite. The revelator, as we read earlier, is Jesus Christ. And we know that when the disciples asked Jesus, what is the time of the end and what is the, what's the sign of your coming in the end of the age or end of the world, they ask him. And that word is aeon, which means end of the age. 
Jesus began to give them some answers. And if you'll turn to Matthew 24, you know, and I'm preaching to the choir here. Your book is probably worn out on these two pages as well. But over in Matthew 24, I want to go through a little bit of this. He says in uh, chapter 24 and verse 4, Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. I mentioned the other last week or last time, down in verse 24, if you'll skip down there and read, it says, For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonder, insomuch that if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect. Being able to make something happen that will make people believe that they're performing some kind of miracle, blowing on people, pushing people over, making them feel as though they've been actually been healed, or actually calling down, as the book of Revelation says, fire down from heaven in the sight of men so that it will deceive the nations of the world. Jesus' very first warning and His answer to His disciples about evidence of His coming was going to be religious deception, wasn't it? And boy, is it out there. And I mentioned last time how that when we begin to see these things come to pass, there's going to be an eruption of false prophets out there. When people begin to see these earthquakes, they're going to get real spooky about what's going on in our world. And they're going to remember something in the back of their mind. Somebody somewhere told them to watch and to look out for what's going on in our world, to be watching the economy, to be watching what's happening in the Middle East, to be watching what's happening with these earthquakes and those awful... uh, Tempest and things that are going in the wor- on the world uh, as far as wars and famines and things like that. And they're going to begin to start trying to preach something they know nothing about. And you just wait and see. They will be coming out of the woodwork professing to be prophets and proclaiming that Jesus is Lord and not knowing anything about the truth of God. We will see. Jesus said that it was going to happen. That's not my interpretation. He is saying that that is going to be there and prevalent at the pinnacle, at the very time of the, of the end. It goes on to say in verse 6, And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Down in verse, uh, if you go back to chapter 6 of Revelation, he says, um, down in verse 3, And when he opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given unto him that he should take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another, and there would be given unto him a great sword. So this, this horse, as it were, and these have been called the four horsemen of the apocalypse in history and in biblical uh, circles, that this second horse here represents a time of war, and, and it's exactly as Jesus described here. John is being transported in time into the day of the Lord. He's beginning to see these horsemen going out that go go out to and fro throughout the earth. And these events are exactly coming to pass just as Jesus described. And exactly in the same order in which Jesus spoke. I read one interesting point about the order that these events occur. And that is that religious deception often leads to war, and wars often lead to famine, and famine often leads to many pestilences. And that's the order of those four horsemen there, as we'll read. He says down in verse 5, And when he opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see, and I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand, And he heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts saying, A measure of wheat for a penny and uh, and three measures of barley for a penny and see that you hurt not the oil or the wine. So here they're taking a scale, measuring out a little bitty. You can almost just see this in, if you you imagine this, a little bitty teacup maybe full of grain. Someone gives a little penny, puts it out there and he measures out a little, maybe a little jigger or something full of grain. enough not even to sustain one's family, much less themselves. And not only 
could they not afford the wheat on some occasions. They had to buy barley, which was something usually given to the cattle. They're out here eating, rooting around, trying to find enough food. You can go back and read, and I've done this, and it's very de depressing to read what happened in World War II when some of these cities were surrounded by the Germans and their supply lines were cut off and people absolutely starved to death. Go back and read what happened to, to in Poland, in Russia, because of these evil men like Stalin and Hitler who wanted to possess so much power and put their people under so much pressure, under so much taxation that they, they're jobless, their rate. You think we've got a bad jobless rate, an unemployment rate of 10%. How about 90%? What would it be like? Where would you go to get food? I was listening this on the radio this week. They were talking about food prices and how green beans and peas and corn and, and those type of basic staples that we, we were once able to produce in hundreds of millions of tons are now almost doubling in prices, going up 60 and 80 percent this last couple of months. Well, some people are on fixed incomes. They have a certain amount each month. And guess what happens to their dollar when the food prices begin to double and triple and maybe become shortage? Look what happened. They're afraid, they're afraid of some of these winter disasters that's happened up in the northeast because people, when they hear these big snowstorms are coming, they go in and em absolutely empty the shelves. And they have to start giving people allowances of only buying so many cans of food. Here in the United States... I can't believe that. It's just something to think about. It's something that Jesus warned about, and I think it is important. I don't want to scare everybody half to death, but it is the time in which we live, and we can't become callous just because we've heard it and heard it and heard it for 40, 50 years. We can't become callous because not everyone chooses to listen. We have to watch, as Jesus said, and stay faithful and 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 pray for His protection, and that's our hope. That's, that's the hope that I, that I asked you about earlier. He said, and Jesus said in Matthew 24, uh, You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these must come to pass. But the end is not yet, even though, as I mentioned last time, nations shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, whole continents against whole continents. We're talking about world war, aren't we? And in a time when these nations possess these evil weapons, nuclear and, and, and uh, atomic weapons. It says, For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom a kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences, just as in the order that Jesus uh, prophesied. We'll go back to Revelation 6, chapter. It says, And when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, the pale horse and his name that sat on him was death and hell, and that should be rendered Hades, really, death and the grave. It's as almost if death and the grave are personified here in this beast or this being that's sitting on this black horse. And power was given unto him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and with the beast of the earth. And what happens to animals when they are let free when people have, you know, I heard a statistic one time, I wish I could remember it, how many dogs we have here in the United States. It will uh, shock you to know how many little small dogs, big dogs, all different sized dogs we have here in the United States. Can you imagine them all being turned loose at once? Well, they would return back to their wild state. They would be very dangerous. We have wild hogs here in Texas. And they can go absolutely and tear up a, a farmer's pasture out here and they run in herds of, of 100 at a time. There are, uh, I forget how many, six or seven million of them in East Texas alone. And they're very dangerous animals. I know a guy that used to trap them and he wore these big old leather chaps and uh, he would trap these hogs and uh, he would try to eliminate some of them because they become such a pest and, te and tear up. And they're absolutely wild. But... Uh, this is this is talking about, a, I guess, a much elevated state of that than just wild hogs that we scarcely see. He says uh, down in verse, <clears throat> verse 9, And when he had opened the fifth seal, 
I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. I'd like to, I, said, I told you I'd mention that here. I'd like to go over, hold your place here to Revelation 12 chapter. Revelation 12 verse 17. It says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's who's left. That's who's left on this earth of the saints. It says that Satan went to make war with the remnant of her seed, speaking of the church, whatever, whoever's left. And they are people who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. What is the testimony of Jesus Christ? Can you tell me what that is? Well, when you go into a courtroom and you, you're called up as a witness and you're put on the witness stand and they say, I want to, you to give me testimony about what you saw or what you know about this case. And you tell them every detail that you know. What is your testimony about Jesus Christ? Well, my, your testimony should be about the birth of Jesus Christ, the life of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, how He lived, how He acted, how He cared for other people, the example that He set for other people, for us to live. All of those that He was there in the beginning with God, that He was God at one time in a God form, that He came down and dwelt among men, that He became our... that He lived, as, as Mike Garrett said last week, He walked in our shoes so that He is... He can be sympathetic toward our life and, and the pain and suffering that we have. That's the testimony of Jesus Christ and what He commanded us to do, more importantly, that He, he instructed us to keep God's law, that there would in no wise, one jot or one tittle in no wise shall fall from the Word of God till all things be fulfilled. That is the testimony of Jesus Christ. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, do you not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? There's this cry, just like the blood of Abel, that symbolically cries out to God for justice. And yet, there is a respite here. There is a time when God says, It's not time yet. I want to hold your place here and also look over at Revelation the 12th chapter, Revelation 12 and verse 10. It's an interesting comparison here to the blood of these saints that cries out day and night to what it says in Revelation 12 and verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ. <clears throat> For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accuses, which accused them before our God day and night. Isn't that a fascinating comparison? The blood of these saints is crying out for justice day and night. And on the other hand, on the evil side of the spectrum, here is Satan accusing brethren day and night. He never stops. He never gives up. He's always there accusing, look what they did, see what they did. See, you ought to just zap them and kill them and destroy them. And you wonder where these kind of attitudes come from sometime even in a church congregation, don't you? Or within, or especially in, a, in the world. The attitude that people have will, who are willing to simply, just like this man the other day did, pull out a gun and just start killing people. Up at the Pentagon, you probably saw that in the news. It says, And white robes were given unto them, every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So there is a time where there is yet religious martyrdom, isn't there? And of course, Jesus, uh, Jesus predicted that. When, uh, back in Matthew 24, when he says that they will deliver you up and afflict you and you shall be killed and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. I'm, I'm back over in the book of Revelation there. I mean, book of Matthew there. He says down in verse, uh, uh, verse 12 in the book of Revelation chapter 6, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake... 
and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. Our earthquakes are in the news today, aren't they? We've had two or three or four right here in a row, and it certainly caught my attention, you know, knowing what I know what the Bible says about earthquake, that it is predicted in, in uh, the book of Isaiah. I'd like to read a few of these, Isaiah, the second chapter. Uh, what the Bible says about earthquakes. Isaiah 2, it says, And the loftiness of man, down in verse 14, shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. Mark and I were talking last week about the absolute arrogance some people possess, not only in politics, but in religion too. And that Anywhere you read in the Word of God, it says that pride is going to be brought down, that it's going to be brought low, that God is going to get rid of pride. He's going to completely annihilate it. And where do you stand? And we'll read that scripture in a minute. Where do you stand? Where do we stand? Where do I stand in that, in that, uh, in that equation? When God is going to destroy everything that's high and lofty and lifted up and high-browed, and proud, he's going to bring it down low? What does that do for all the people who are prideful? Do you know anybody that's prideful? <laughs> Turn on the television. Look at the news. Look at your politicians. Look at the average people you work for, your employer. How people are so absolutely full of themselves and think that they're so mighty and above everyone else. We shudder when we think, you know, the old saying goes... I'm going to stand away from this guy because I'm afraid lightning is going to strike him and kill him. And when God strikes him with lightning, it's going to kill everybody big enough to die. You know, the old saying. I want to get away from somebody like that. But that's... Uh, down. Let's continue down in verse 18. And the idols shall be utterly abolished, and they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for the fear of the Lord and for the glory of His majesty when He arises to shake terribly the earth. Uh, let's read a few more here uh, over in Isaiah, while you're here in Isaiah, the 13th chapter. Isaiah 13. <clears throat> I hope I can get to the one that I was wanting to read. Down in verse 10, for the, for the stars... Let's see. Okay. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall, cause, shall not cause her light to shine. Now these are observations of people that are standing here on the earth. The book of Revelation talks about stars falling from the sky. That's impossible. If a star, you know, pick one. The smallest star that you can think of out there that's probably 10,000 times as large as the earth can't fall and hit the earth. It would totally be annihilated with all mankind on it. It's what man sees and what he what it looks like is happening, that some meteor shower is raining down big, great big fire and brimstone on the earth, and it looks like stars of heaven falling to this earth. That's what man sees. And it so braises a cloud of dust due to that activity and due to the war that's broken out on the face of this earth that it absolutely obliterates the sun at noontime. That happened when Jesus was crucified, by the way, didn't it? This wasn't the first time that it became black at sackcloth of hair or as cloth, as they say. And it also happened to the ancient Israelites too, didn't it? Back in the land of Goshen. It became black as ink for three days, didn't it? Can you imagine that? No sunlight? You know, when I go out at night or even early in the morning when I get out to go out and feed the animals... There's a little bit of twilight, a little bit of light, even from the, from the stars sometime, even well before the sun coming up, you can still see. But can you imagine black ink, nothing, no light from any direction? It would be horrible to think about. He says, I will punish the world for their evil. I asked the question in the beginning, when is it all going to end? When is all the corruption going to end? Well, here it is. Jesus said, I'm, I mean, God says, I'm going to punish the world for their evil and for the wicked and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. And I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even more 
even a man than the gold, golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore, I will shake the heaven and the earth shall remove out of her place. Over in another place in the book of Isaiah, I believe it is, he says that the earth reels to and fro like a drunkard. An unimaginable earthquake. We're not talking about an earthquake that is an 8 or a 9. Maybe we're talking about one that is a 25 or a 30 or a 50. I don't know. It says the mountains are going to change their topography. Every high mountain is going to be brought low. And every deep place is going to be brought up. Is that literal? Can we, can we you know, the book of Revelation talks about that mountain there in Jerusalem. That the, that the mount will be split in two. And half will go towards the former and half towards the hinder. See, it's going to be divided. That's an earthquake now when you start moving mountains around. He says, um, back in the book of Revelation, um, in chapter, um, chapter 6 and verse 12, he says, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. I do want to turn to uh, Joel, the second chapter. Joel 2. I have to read this verse here because this is so makes so clear the order of events that we read not only in the Old Testament but in Jesus' own words. Joel 2 and verse 31. And this whole book of Joel is absolutely right along the same lines as what we read about here in the book of Revelation. I wish I had time to go through all of it, but it says down in verse 31, uh, let's begin in verse... Uh, 29, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. I will show wonders in the heavens and the earth, blood of, and fire and pillar of smoke, pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. Absolutely the same description. Before the great and terrible day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Now if you'll turn over to uh, Matthew the 24th chapter. Back to Matthew 24, excuse me. <clears throat> In verse 29 it says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. So we have the great tribulation, the tribulation of those days Right here in Jesus' own words, he says, After the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened. So we have the tribulation. And then these cataclysmic events that cause the heavenly signs, the blackening of the sunlight and the moonlight. And then, after that, notice down in verse 30, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. Where is the rapture in all of that? Where can you place the rapture in that scenario? If God clearly tells us in Jesus' own words that the great tribulation is going to take place first, then the heavenly signs, and then finally after all of these plagues that we read about in the book of Revelation, by the way, there are seven seals, and we've only gone through six of them right here. There are seven seals, and the seventh of those seals is divided up into seven Plagues, seven trumpet plagues that we'll read about that begin to rain down upon mankind. And the last three of those are called three woes. The last three of those trumpet plagues are called three woes. The last of those woes, which is later on in the book of Revelation, there are several inset chapters here that we have to go through before we get to that seventh last trumpet plague. That seventh trumpet plague is divided up into seven last plagues. And can you believe that at, through all of that, that the Bible says there are still those who will curse God? Even through all of that, that all that they've seen and all that they know and all that is happening around them will not repent. That blows my mind. You can't take a two-by-four and beat somebody to death and make them understand that God is a loving God, He's a forgiving God, and He wants them to repent. When people have their mindset that they're going to be rebellious, I don't care what you do. I mean, we're talking about global events taking place that are going to change the surface of this earth, and people will still not repent. Does man have any 
control over those events. Who's going to be standing up talking about global climate change then? Let's read on here. I'm going to finish this chapter here. Boy, I'm out of time. I was going to try to go through chapter 7 too, but I'll have to do that another time. He says in this, The stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree cast her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled up together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. I hate to see that. There are some of the most beautiful atolls and South Pacific islands. I'd love to go visit every one of them. There are probably 3,500 of them around the world. Beautiful, absolute. Some of them are just crater rings, the, out, the, the outer fringes that are left of a crater that was once there that are filled with beautiful clear water and beautiful marine life. I'd love to go dive and see and snorkel around some of these places, but I can't imagine all of these islands moving around. I'm sure God will uh, let us uh, experience those in a different way at a different time. It says, And the kings of the earth... Now these are all the men that are full of pride, some of them, but notice who all is included. The kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the chief captains, the mighty men, and every bondman, every slave, every free man, hid themselves in the dens of the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us. He's quoting here from the book of Isaiah. And hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? I ask the question, what are you going to do in that day? When there he is, the heavens roll back like a scroll. I try to imagine in my mind what he is telling me there. What does that mean that the heavens are going to roll back like a scroll? Does that mean the very vision that we see out here in our atmosphere, the stars, the blackness that we see out there is going to somehow part open and God's throne is going to be revealed to us or His, Jesus, the coming of Jesus Christ is going to come in some manner that is so absolutely brilliant that it boggles your mind, that men will fall over from a heart attack, that people will... It says that they will grab, grab their loins as a woman who's in labor for the pain that is upon them and for the suffering. Their men are crying out here to be killed by a mountain, that a mountain would fall on them so they don't have to look upon this vision and this scene. Where will pride be in that day? Where will hatred be? Where will a lot of the problems that we have in our own lives be? What will we be concerned with then? What will be so important to us then? When He is there, here He is, He's coming. Have you ever thought about what you will do that day? Well, next time, when we go into the book of Revelation in chapter 7, we're going to find out what that hope is.